This is Dr. Robert J. Shiflett presenting to you Dr. Howard C. E. Stepp of the World Prophetic Ministry in Colton, California. Dr. E. Stepp is teaching the book of the Acts here in the King is Coming Auditorium. And now let us listen to Dr. E. Stepp with lesson number 15, Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through verse 41. If you'll open your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 15, we shall begin our study of verse by verse of the second half of the book of the Acts. We concluded our last lesson with the missionary journey of the Apostle Paul coming to a grinding halt when he had been with Barnabas and they'd been traveling around up through Turkey, what is now Turkey, and down through the island of Cyprus and then going back to Antioch in Syria. I have a lesson outlined for you. One, the question of law-keeping, Acts 15, verses 1 through 2. Two, Paul and Barnabas sent as delegates to the first general council of Christians in Jerusalem, verses 3 through 4. Three, purpose of the council that was called in Jerusalem, verses 5 through 6. Four, Peter defends the Christians from the law, verses 7 through 11. Five, the council is pro and con on the subject of Christians, that is, Jews and Gentiles, not keeping the law. That was verses 12 through 21. Six, Christian unity comes out of the council meeting, verses 22 through 29. Seven, The Jerusalem Council causes great joy in Christian circles, verses 30 through 34. And last, Paul plans a second missionary journey, and that's verses 35 through 41. So if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 15, we shall begin our lesson. The first part is the question of law-keeping. Verses 1 through 2, verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. You must remember that the Christian church was less than 100 years old at this particular time. And there are divisions. There are people who are persuaded other than what the Scriptures actually taught. Because when you read verse 1, and you read here, and certain men which came down from Judea did certain things, if you look at verse 24, you read about those men, what they were causing. Just glance over at verse 24. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying... You must be circumcised and keep the law. So back in that day, there were people who were saying that it isn't enough to trust Christ as Savior. You got to keep the law. You must be circumcised. You must do what Moses laid down way back there 1,500 years ago. And the Christian church is in its first 100 years of duration right after the establishing of the church. So verse 1 tells us there were certain men there in the area rubbing elbows with Christians in the church saying that it's necessary if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be circumcised and you must keep the law, otherwise you can't be saved. Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. In other words, Paul and Barnabas took these certain men there in the church to task when they had uh, an argument or a confrontation with them or a debate or uh, whatever you want to call it. The problem in verse 2 was that Paul and Barnabas determined that they and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. 
because Paul and Barnabas are having problems. Now, they are in Antioch in Syria. This is where Paul and Barnabas finished their missionary tour. And so now they are having trouble in their church. There are men teaching incorrectly, so Paul says. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas get the idea, let's all go down to Jerusalem. And let's call a general council of the church. Because we want to thrash this thing out and come to a general understanding so we'll know what we're doing. It's a new church. Less than a hundred years old. They don't have the New Testament as we have it today because we can take the epistles and the various other writings in the New Testament and we can tell exactly what we're supposed to do. But they had none of that. So they said, let's call a council of the church in Jerusalem. Let's go down there. Let's find out what we're supposed to do. So that's the question of law keeping in verses 1 through 2. Secondly, Paul and Barnabas are sent as delegates to the first general council of the church in Jerusalem. And this is verses 3 through 4. And being brought on their way by the church, evidently the church paid their way to go from Antioch in Syria down to Jerusalem. They passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. They are in strict Jewish country. But as they traveled, they told everywhere they went about the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Generally, when Christians get saved, other Christians rejoice. Because the Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven among the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And there's no greater spiritual joy for a child of God than to see a lost sinner come to the realization that his sins can be blotted out by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And wherever Paul and Barnabas traveled on their way from Antioch in Syria down to Jerusalem, they were telling about how the Gentiles had received the message. And they had been at Antioch in Presidia, you remember. They had a great meeting up there. Literally hundreds of people got saved. And Paul was on cloud nine, as it were. And everywhere he went, he was telling the people about the great missionary journey it had. And it says, There was tremendous joy unto all the brethren because of the Gentiles being saved. Verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem... They were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. You notice they gave God the glory. They declared all things that God had done with them. So we find them arriving in Jerusalem. They're ready to uh, meet in this council. They want to get down to the root of the matter and find out Can a Jew be a Christian and not have to keep the Mosaic law? And can a Gentile come in to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and not have to observe the rules and regulations and the various customs that the Jews had under the law? Big, big cloudy issue. Let's blow the smoke away and get down to brass tacks and find out in one, two, three order, what are we supposed to do? What's the purpose of the council? It tells us in verses 5 through 6, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Now they believed, but were law keepers. The, The sect of the Pharisees, mind you, they believed. But they also believed in keeping the law. And isn't it strange that 1,900 years later, we have the same situation prevailing in our world? We have people today who say, receive Jesus Christ and be saved. You can hear them say this on their radio broadcasts and on their television programs. Receive Christ and be saved, but keep the law or keep parts of the law. Same situation prevailing today 
as it did 1,900 years ago. Why? People never change. People are the same everywhere you go. As I've had the very blessed privilege of traveling over probably a third of our world, more of a third than a half, I have found people all the same everywhere. Now, I haven't always understood their language and their dialects, but they understand a smile. They understand a kindness. They understand handing them a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or sharing uh, a little bag of American peanuts or a cookie or something. They all understand that. People are the same everywhere. And people today are confused, the same as they were 1,900 years ago. This sect of the Pharisees in verse 5, they believed, oh yes, we're Christians. We have pulled out of Judaism. We're members of the Baptist church in Jerusalem, as I heard an evangelist say one time. He wanted to establish the fact that the Baptist church was in Jerusalem. Well, be that as it may, that's neither here nor there. They were saying that it was needful to circumcise these people and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. When you study New Testament church history, this is one of the great meetings that you'll study about is that this first council meeting in Jerusalem, when all of these Christians came together all over what we now call the Middle East, they came together for one simple little purpose, and that was to decide, was it necessary for Gentiles to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be a member of the body of Christ? And we have the same thing today. Point four. Peter defends the Christians from the law. Peter, the great fisherman, he's going to defend the Christians from the law. This is verses 7 through 11. And when there had been much disputing, evidently this business meeting got into a hot confrontation, and Peter rose up, it says in verse 7, and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago... And this refers to a period of about 10 or 12 years previously, recorded in Acts 10, verse 20. Peter says, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter is rehearsing what we have studied previously, that he was asleep on a housetop down at Joppa, and God lowered a sheet down, and all kinds of animals and so forth were in the sheet, and God was teaching Simon Peter a lesson that God is no respecter of person. Though we may come from different ethnic backgrounds and ancestral roots and all of that, in the eyes of God, God treats us all alike. And Peter's saying that very thing right here in verse 7. Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And he's bringing up, rehearsing, bringing up the incident that led him from Joppa up to Caesarea by the sea where Peter had the opportunity of giving the gospel to a Gentile, a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. And at the home of Cornelius, it's Caesarea by the sea, the Gentiles first heard the gospel. They had not yielded to the gospel up to that particular point. God gave the gospel to the Jews first. The Bible by the pen of the Apostle Paul says that to them were committed the oracles of God. And Peter had the opportunity of presenting the gospel to the first Gentiles at Caesarea by the sea. And that's what he said in verse 7. God made choice among us. And when he says God made choice among us, this proves that Gentiles, before Acts verse, uh, chapter 10, had not been given the gospel. 
God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, verse 8, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. In other words, God is the one who considered the Gentiles fit to be saved. Gentiles, in the eyes of the Jews, were just dogs. But God does not decree anybody a dog or lower than the other person. In the eyes of God, we're all alike. It is the will of the Father that not one of the little ones perish. Whosoever will may come. The gospel is free. The same as water is free. It's the plumbing that costs. It's the piping, the delivery that costs. The gospel is free. But building a building like this at a half a million dollars, that isn't free. But the gospel is free. But you have to have a place to get in out of the weather so you can preach the gospel, which is free. It's a very important thing here in verse 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts of all men, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. For God to bear witness is simply approving and setting his seal upon the thing. In this case, God gave the Gentiles the same spirit baptism that he gave at Pentecost and made no difference between Jews and Gentiles in Christ. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, we have the Holy Spirit of God coming to the Jews on the day of Pentecost and the spirit baptism that God gave the Jews on that day. He gave eight years later at Caesarea by the sea to the Gentiles the same experience identically. God is no respecter of persons. And we have to be careful sometimes. Because we get ourselves caught up in a vocabulary and we say, I've had the Pentecostal experience. Then I say to you, then are you a Jew? Because on Pentecost, that was for the Jews. Eight years later, it was for the Gentiles. You see how easy it is to get yourself into error by just following the vocabulary of people who don't really think and get right down and study these things in a very finite manner? The Gentiles had the same experience, but they didn't have it on Pentecost. Pentecost is 50. They had it eight years later. But it was the same thing, proving that God is no respecter of persons. This is Peter defending the Christians from the law. Peter is saying it's not necessary that Christians keep the law. Verse 9. And God put no difference between us and them. I stuck in the word God to make it read because the word God is in verse 8, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. It's God that purifies the heart. We can't purify our heart. Anytime someone says to you, when I get in a better condition, or when I clean myself up, or when I'm ready, then I'll be saved. It's God that purifies the heart. It's God that sanctifies the heart. And God purified their hearts. So it tells us in verse 9, verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciple, plural, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Peter has uh, arisen to the situation, and Peter is saying so in so many words, These Gentiles that want to be Christians, why put a yoke around their necks? Why saddle them with the law and the customs and schemes of our fathers? Why saddle our friends, the Gentiles, with all of that? Because it was impossible to keep the law. So Peter is saying in so many words, very able defense of the situation. 
which neither the latter part of verse 10, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Peter is saying the Gentiles and the Jews are going to be saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, proving that salvation cannot be of works. No way in the world you can have salvation by works. Now, works are nice, but works come after the grace of God has performed the miracle of salvation in your life. Then there will be works. And any time someone says, I'm saved and no works, I doubt their salvation. Because the works are proof plus that you have been saved by the grace of God. So Peter Mays makes a good defense here of the Christians from the law. We proceed and we see what the council is doing. Now he's standing up there in Jerusalem in this church, in this place where these early Christians are gathering where the New Testament church had its beginning. And there's a pro and con situation prevailing in the council meeting on the subject of Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, not keeping the law. What happens? We look at verse 12 through 21. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Now Peter finished, and then Paul begins to speak. He gets up. He follows Peter to the rostrum. He makes his speech. And this is what happens. And all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. They're coming on the scene, and now they're going to rehearse their missionary journey that took them three years from the shores of Syria over to Cyprus, up into southern Turkey, and all around and about, and then back down, they retracted all the way back to Antioch and Syria. Now they've come from Antioch and Syria down to Jerusalem, and uh, Paul's going to tell them all about that. He's going to tell them and show them and rehearse to them how the Gentiles got saved. Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them, verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Peter spoke, Paul, Barnabas, now James is going to speak. Men and brethren, hearken unto me, verse 14. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. Now, he's not calling him by the name of Peter, but he's saying that Simon declared at first declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Peter made that statement. James is rehearsing it, verse 15. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue or the rest or the balance of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. James is reminding them that what has happened with Paul and Barnabas going out on their first missionary journey and by what Peter has spoken of, how he went from Joppa up to Caesarea by the sea to the house of Cornelius, James is just bringing it all together and, and saying in so many words, God is trying to save everybody. Are we going to get in the way and stop the work of God? And many times I think this is where we Christians fail. Sometimes we allow ourselves to get in the way and God can't work or move successfully because we stand in the way of the workings of the Holy Spirit in our midst. James is a very intelligent man because he saw this whole thing and he capped it, summarized it, put it all together. Verse 17. 
that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is, this is what James is coming to the conclusion after he said everything. This is a sum and subtotal that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. We Jews should not interfere with the Gentiles who have turned to God. Don't stand in their way. Don't give them any problems. Verse 20. But that we write unto them four laws for Gentile Christians. Now, this is in the New Testament at the first council meeting in Jerusalem. Verse 20, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. James is making a suggestion here that these Gentile Christians who are wanting to associate themselves with we Jews who have turned their backs upon Judaism, and we have been converted, and we're in the New Testament church, and now Gentiles are wanting to come in and join with us. Let's establish a four-point rule that we'll all abide by. That's what he's saying. What was the four-point rule? Abstain from pollution of idols. It literally means to have nothing to do with, stand aloof from idols, eating things offered to idols, and all immoral acts attendant on such festivals. Now, right there, Christians can't have anything to do with that. We cannot have anything to do with idols. There's only one God, the true and the living God, and he reigns in the realm above in the third heaven. The second point that James brought out was to abstain from fornication, all uncleanness, homosexuality, and other perversions and prostitution which was so common at idol temples. If you ever travel to Greece, in all probability they'll take you to Corinth. And at Corinth, you'll look up on a mountaintop and the guide will tell you the history of that tremendous castle of fortification up there where there were in constant habitation of that place 10,000 prostitutes at all times. Sex was big business in the old world. Don't think that sex has just now been discovered, my friends. It was a way of life. In the big religious temples, thousands of prostitutes circulated in and among the places, offering their virtue. And many times they were virgin girls who gave their virtue for a life offering to their pagan god. James is saying, let's abstain from fornication. Three, let's abstain from things strangled. When animals were strangled, the blood remained in their bodies contrary to Leviticus chapter 17, this being considered as making a greater delicacy. Peter, or at least James, says let's don't eat anything that's strangled. That's why under the Jewish system of killing animals, they slit the juggler vein and the animal drains the blood out of the body. The meat is considered better eating. That's why we're not supposed to eat blood. I never could understand why at the meat market they sold blood pudding. It never appealed to me in any way. I just couldn't get an appetite for it. I didn't realize as a born-again child of God, I'm not supposed to eat those kind of things. Four, abstain from blood. This not only includes eating blood, but all cruelty and murder in its various forms. So... Uh, James made this suggestion in verse 20, the four-point law for Gentile Christians. Abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from eating blood. Verse 21, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So evidently, 
The law of Moses was read in the synagogues every seventh day Jewish Sabbath. And so Peter is making, or at least James is making this known unto the people. So we have the pro and the cons on the subject of Christians not keeping the law, verses 12 through 21. We move into Christian unity, comes out of the council. This begins in verse 22 and concludes with 29, verse 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So the council meeting at Jerusalem, when they came together to determine, can God save Gentiles as well as he can save Jews? Evidently, they agreed that God was no respecter of persons after these tremendous presentations by Peter and by Paul and Barnabas and by James It says that the whole church was in unity about this thing. Verse 22, it pleased the apostles and elders. And so they got ready to send men back with Paul and Barnabas on their way back to Antioch in Syria. Verse 23, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now, why is the church in Jerusalem sending a letter by Paul and Silas, correction, by Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch and Syria, because these men in Antioch and Syria are up there telling the Gentile converts that they can't be saved unless they keep the law. Same thing that we have today. Verse 25, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord, this letter says. Evidently, the meeting was a success in Jerusalem. Being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. In other words, if you don't believe the letter that we're sending you, we're sending you two of our men, Judas and Silas, going back with Paul and Barnabas, and these two men who are delegates from our church will tell you that this letter which we're sending by by Paul and Barnabas is the truth because these two men will tell you the same thing. That's what they're saying here in verse 26. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 27, when we have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. You see, if God demanded more of a Jew to be saved, or let's put it the other way, if God demanded more of a Gentile to be saved than he did of a Jew, then God wouldn't be a just God. God would show partiality. And that wouldn't be fair. And God is a God of fairness and righteousness. No partiality does God show. And so there in that early church, some 50, 60 years after Christ, those men in Jerusalem were were intelligent men. Very intelligent. Good logic. Verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. 29. What are the necessary things? It tells you in verse 29 that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well, or may God bless you. So that's the Jerusalem council, or at least that's the 
Christian unity comes out of the council meeting, uh, verses 22 through 29. So they have this big meeting in Jerusalem. Big deal. Can Gentiles be saved the same as Jews out of it? They have complete unity. They send a letter out to the churches because other churches must have sent delegates down to Jerusalem. So they send out letters to all of the sister churches telling them what the result of the meeting was. Now, the Jerusalem Council causes great joy in Christian circles. We pick this up in 30 through 34. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. When Paul and Barnabas arrived back in Antioch of Syria, evidently uh, these other men went with them, Judas and Silas. So when they got back into their home area in Antioch, they uh, delivered the epistle. They called the church together far and wide. They all came in. They knew they'd been down to Jerusalem for a big meeting. They want to know what are the results. So the church comes together, verse 31, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. All the Christians were happy about it. They rejoiced for the consolation. They congratulated Paul and Barnabas. They met uh, Judas and Silas. Uh, they congratulated each other. They said, now we know where we are. Uh, Gentiles can be saved the same as Jews. So there was tremendous unity. But every time you get on a mountain peak, the next step is to go down into the valley. I love mountain peaks, but I tell you I fear them. Because in my long ministry, every time I get on a mountain peak, I know the next step is the valley. Christian life never goes on a smooth even plain. Never. No Christian life goes on a simple, even plain. It goes like this. Always mountain, valley, mountain, valley. Now, in the valleys, mentally and spiritually, we maintain a mountaintop experience, though we're in the valley. God gives us that power and that ability to maintain a mental mountaintop experience even though physically we're in the valley. Now, what happened? Great joy when they got back into town. Verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets and also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them, Verse 33, and after they had tarried there a space, these men had stayed there in Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas for a while. They had tarried for a space. They were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. Watch what's going to happen. Paul plans a second missionary journey, verses 35 through 41. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also, 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, this Paul had itchy feet. Paul liked to travel. He would have made a good Bible land tour host. He liked to organize and get out and go visit. Now, I'll prove my point. He just had a three-year tour of Cyprus and southern Turkey, his first missionary journey. What's happening here? Verse 36, some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. He just got back. He hasn't been back too long. He just had a, a church paid expense tour down to Jerusalem. Now he gets back to Antioch. They, they make their reports, read the reports and share them. Now he wants to get out and get going again. 
Let's go around to this place where we made all of this three-year missionary journey. Let's go back over the same area into the same towns, visit the same churches, and let's find out how they're doing. Verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John. Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas traveling with Paul determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. A young fellow by the name of John Mark. Barnabas, for some reason or other, had a liking toward John Mark. So Barnabas says, I want to take John Mark with us. Verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them. I don't know why. That's neither here nor there. Paul said, now this won't work. Well, one reason, because when you stop at a farmhouse... And a double bed will only hold two. How are you going to get three in a double bed? <laughs> it has no theological bearing up on the subject. But I've traveled around quite a bit. And people said, uh, uh, we have a double bed and you, you, you two can sleep in that. And you try to put three in a double bed, you got problems. Now, whether that was the main reason or not, I don't know. But verse 38, But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. In other words, John Mark left them on the first missionary journey in southern Turkey, didn't go all the way with them. For some reason or other, Paul still resented that. He had he had some reason that he just didn't have the full confidence of John Mark. So... Uh, Paul says, won't work, can't take him. Verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them. The feeling among these two great men of God, Paul and Barnabas. You'd say, I didn't think Christians ever had short words one with another. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because... Christians have their own personality. Christians are molded. They're shaping in the mother's womb. And they have certain traits. And when you bring these two people together, you have friction many times. Even in the so-called closely knit Christian circles. And there couldn't have been a more closely knitted circle than Paul and Barnabas. And verse 39 says, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. Paul just got up and walked out. He said, I won't have anything to do with that. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Paul wanted to go back over the area that he had had his first missionary, and Barnabas got heated on the matter, and he got John Mark, and they went down to the dock. They caught a sailing vessel over to the island of Cyprus. That's what it says, verse 40. And Paul chose Silas. It's amazing how God works, because Silas must have been a song leader. You remember when Paul and Silas were in jail and they were singing? I believe it was Silas that was the song leader. So he chose him, somebody that could sing. So he chose Silas. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And the church at Antioch put their stamp of approval upon Paul and Silas, and they said, you have our blessing. As you go, we'll be praying for you. We'll be remembering you. Keep in touch with us. If we can help you in any way, we'd be happy to do so. Verse 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. He went from church to church to church, strengthening the church, telling them what went on in Jerusalem, and confirming them in the faith, telling them that God did not smile upon the Jews only, but the plan of salvation was available to both Gentile and Jew, because God is no respecter of persons. Chapter 15 of the book of Acts. Please turn your tape over for the next in this series on the book of the Acts.